research for a long time. And she is a fellow of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, as well as a co-chair of the ABA Technology Committee of the Dispute Resolution Section and the ODR Task Force. Professor Schmitz has de delivered over 150 presentations on various topics throughout the world and is regularly interviewed and quoted on consumer law in the media. This includes the New York Times, the Washington Post, and many others. She has won various awards, including the Lloyd E. Roberts Memorial Prize in the Administration of Justice 2021, and she's a four-time winner of the Sandgrid Award for Best Consumer Rights Work. Professor Smith also hosts the Arbitration Conversation, a highly regarded podcast that has reached over 100 episodes. She also is a researcher with the ACT Project Exploring AI and Dispute Resolution at the Cyber Justice Lab in Montreal. She has published over 60 articles in law journals and books and is co-author of the leading casebook, Resolving Disputes, Theory, Practice and Law, the new book with Stena, uh, Stepanovich, Arbitration, titled Arbitration, Theory, Practice and Law, and a book also titled The New Handshake, Online Dispute Resolution and the Future of Consumer Protection. Thank you very much, Dr. Amy Schmidt, for having us. Um, over to you. But before I um, go forward, just a few housekeeping rules. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we can take them um, when Dr. Schmidt is over. Please also mute your microphones while the session is going. Um, if um, we'd like you to speak afterwards, we can unmute you, but please kindly mute, you know, so we don't distract um, Dr. Schmidt as, as she goes along. So thank you very much, everyone. Over to you, Dr. Schmidt. So first of all, thank you. I really, truly am so appreciative. Um, I always really enjoy talking with you all and I feel very blessed to be with you today on my birthday. And I see so many friendly faces in the audience, which just brings me incredible joy. I'm also nervous because there's many of you who know more about this than me. I see Sarah Harani and others. Um, so I hope you'll chime in with questions and comments. So I'm gonna go directly to my, um, to my PowerPoint. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'll go to slideshow mode um, if this is good. Um, so I'm gonna talk about smart contract ODR. So online dispute resolution for smart contracts. But before we go there, I just like to start out sort of setting the ground and setting the background about smart contracts and blockchain. As I like to say, they're not necessarily contracts and they're not necessarily smart. Um, so it's really important to sort of put this into context. Blockchain has just boomed, as I like to say. Um, Bitcoin, of course, we all know about, which is in the blockchain, but there's now over 1600 cryptocurrencies. We also know that Ethereum and other distributed ledgers have grown in use in many different business cases outside of blockchain. Additionally, there's a mainstreaming of smart contracts. Companies like Racket Lawyer, law firms, we're seeing great use of smart contracts in many different industries. Even in 2018, we saw over 2.1 billion. And if you look at the amount of money that's now being put into blockchain, that is exponentially higher. So what is blockchain? What are we talking about? Well, it's really a new system for building trust. It's converting a vehicle from trust from one form to another. You can think of, for example, in international relations, you look often at letters of credit. Letters of credit have been very common for a long time. Well, instead, you could use blockchain. It's a way to build trust and relying on this distributed ledger in order to trust the math, in order to follow the contract in a transparent manner. It's really a version of a database record on many computers distributed throughout the world in many cases. And the reason blockchain is trusted is because it can't be changed. Also, if it is a public chain, if it's a public chain, it's trusted because it's transparent and it's public. You can actually watch the ledger in real time in this computerized ledger. Moreover, it supports data integrity. We see ways of using blockchain in order to support even submission of evidence. We've seen this in China, for example, and elsewhere. 
Also for identity authentication and having cryptographic keys built into the blockchain. Some of the core concepts that we talk about in blockchain, especially when you're dealing with a public chain, is to have a distributed ledger. Again, there's not a central authority to hold the ledger or to be attacked. And all of these computers, otherwise known as nodes, have that complete ledger. It's transparent but anonymous because it's tied to a cryptographic key. And it can be public while concealing identity. It can be private or permission, also depending on the type of chain you're using. When we talk about append-only ledgers, that means that you can only add, you cannot change what's already there. When we say it's immutable, what that means is that if you want to attack it, you would have to be able to attack 51% of all those computers. Think of it this way. For example, if you have a castle, right, and there's only one castle, and if, if you have all of your data in that one castle, and you have a moat around that castle, then all you have to do is get over that moat and attack that castle, and then you get all the data, right? And so that hacker only has to attack one castle. When we talk about blockchain, think about now having to attack and overcome over 51% of thousands of castles and thousands of moats. That's a lot more difficult. And so the idea is that when you have blockchain, it is going to be safer and more secure. Again, some very practical examples that we see, as you all know about Bitcoin, um, it definitely employs blockchain model, um, other um, cryptocurrencies as well. Um, also transactions, is this where we get into smart contracts? And the idea that code is law and that you can code a agreement or performance really into a transaction. And I use transaction because it is not necessarily a contract, which I'll get to in a moment, but also for security, as we talked about earlier. It's really disrupting a lot of different areas. Shipping industry, for example, the Hong Kong Belt and Road Initiative has used some, some variances of smart contracts. Finance, banks who are using it for security, records, Estonia, for example, and India are leading the way in using blockchain for record keeping, healthcare for securing and tracking healthcare data. Of course, law, smart contracts, and even blockchain courts, which we will get to momentarily. And of course, cryptocurrencies. Moving more directly into smart contracts, well, in 1994 is really when all of this started. So um, we think it's all brand new, but it's really not that new, okay? Because 1994 is when Nick Szabo, legal scholar and cryptographer, he was the one who really first started this idea of utilizing smart contracts. And this idea of putting things in an if-then form via computer code. You can think of it, and I know many people have used this example, but I do think it helps sort of like a vending machine, right? You push whatever type of coffee or whatever type of candy bar you want, and it automatically comes out. There doesn't have to be any further negotiation. It is essentially set in the code within that vending machine. The idea can be the same even in an automatic payment system. And it can replace, for example, letters of credit, which I talked about earlier, which is a financing mechanism that is very common in international deals, but can be very expensive and can involve expensive lawyers, expensive financing costs. And so smart contracts have become a prominent idea for getting out of that mode. Another place we've seen this idea of using a smart contract is actually voting to make it such that you can pro provide some kind of security and it's computer code, right? And so this is what it could look like in computer code. Another example, computer code, right? That's all it is. You and I can look at this and we have no idea what it means, but what it does is it moves everything along in an if then format such that you could provide some more security with respect to voting, which is often contentious in many countries. Some of the attributes, again, the idea of digital signatures and this private cryptographic key can become very important in terms of verifying and showing that it is in fact your smart contract or you deserve the performance. Oracles, this is an idea where you incorporate an oracle into the smart contract, which is a mutually agreed upon network to authenticate information. You could link it to, for example, commodity prices, weather data, interest rates, or even event occurrence, such as, for example, in shipping, when the ship reaches the harbor, you could actually have it coded as an Oracle smart contract 
specifically allow for automatic payment when the ship reaches the harbor. Self-execution, that is a huge attribute to not have to go to the courts. The idea, again, is that by computer code, you can avoid the courts. Said another way, here are some of the benefits. There's a lot of touting, a lot of literature about how it can create speed and efficiency, autonomy, not having to rely on or pay third parties such as lawyers, trust, transparency, encryption, security, immutability. Areas, the sharing economy, insurance, supply chain, construction, financial service, telecoms. These are all areas where we see smart contracts becoming a really very smart idea in some cases. However, all that, all the hype, is it really all it's kind of built up to be? I'm not so sure. Number one, is it really a contract? Well, I'm a contracts professor and I'm here to tell you, not really. First of all, it's just algorithmic code. So it's very unclear that you have your good old fashioned offer, acceptance, consideration. It's also decentralized. So there's no identifiable jurisdiction. So good luck trying to sue somebody in somebody's actual physical courts on a smart contract disputes. It could be quite complicated. It's anonymous. It's sometimes unclear who and where the parties are. And coding is kind of unclear documentation under civil law and unclear with respect to the statute of frauds under common law. So you might run into some sort of contract enforcement questions if you have to resort to the courts, if you have to go to a court of law, and if you have to go back to good old fashioned contract law. Another caveat is this idea of public versus private chains. You know, back when we talked about Bitcoin, we were talking about public chains, but now it's much more nuanced. We have permissionless and permissioned blockchains. You have the Hyperledger fabric, for example, in the permissioned and private area growing in use and has quite different attributes. Insiders do say that private is the future as business consortiums develop their own permissioned blockchains. Crypto economists on their hand say public is really only true that actually supports the libertarian cause. And just as you know, our good friend Ethan Catch said a long time ago, um, technology is not gonna prevent disputes. It's gonna create more disputes. I would argue that this emergence of blockchain, the blockchain boom and smart contracts has actually created more issues. What are some of the issues we already see and are going to grow? First of all, breach failed performance. Like any other agreement, there are gonna be questions. Did that ship really reach the harbor? Were, was, were the goods intact? Were the goods of the quality that was promised? There can be coding errors. In fact, I went into a deep dive where I was researching and talked to specific people who actually code smart contracts. And they said that even coding can be interpreted differently depending on how you were trained in your computer coding classes, right? There's gonna be mistakes, coding errors in these smart contracts. Remediation, there's gonna be disputes about how do you provide a remedy in a smart contract blockchain fabric. Lack of capacity. We see this with the DAO and decentralized organizations, right? Well, do they really have capacity to contract? Because now we have smart contracts entering into smart contracts. And if that doesn't give you a headache, <laughs> I don't know what would. I mean, that gives us all a headache, right? These are very big issues that can raise legal questions and disputes. Incomplete contracts. Does the smart contract actually take care of all the possibilities and eventualities? Enforcement. How do you actually make sure, even though you're supposed to have automatic enforcement, what if it doesn't work for some reason? Some error in the code or some other problem, you're going to have problems with enforcement, especially if you're going to have to rely on an actual physical court and judicial jurisdiction. Moreover, if you actually did try to litigate a smart contract case and you went to a court of law, how many judges are going to be able to understand smart contracts. How many judges are going to be able to understand coding errors, right? I know at least here in the U.S., most judges are older individuals who are not very active in technology. And in fact, they may not even barely send emails, let alone know what a smart contract is or the issues that could arise. So there are a lot of different questions that could arise if you actually had to go to a court of law. So what do we know? We know, number one, that absolutely smart contracts are growing in use and they have different uses and different benefits. They also have problems and issues will arise and disputes will arise. So we have to come up with ideas of dealing with 
blockchain dispute resolution. Several have risen to the top. Number one, arbitration on the blockchain. Some examples are Open Bazaar and others. Even here in the US, we see the American Arbitration Association having different arbitrators who are specialized in technology and would be able to answer some of those questions. So that's just good old fashioned arbitration with a live person who is deciding blockchain dispute resolution, things regarding smart contracts and this will go to a private arbitrator. You can imagine this could be under the ICC rules, the AAA, ICDR. You could go under any various rules and actually have good old fashioned arbitration. But the real story and sort of really interesting cases, and I see Dr. Harani was, is here as well and who's an expert in the field, is crowdsourced dispute resolution. And here what we're seeing is tokenized voting on the blockchain. Now we can fight about whether it's mob justice or is it just gamification or is it a valid application of game theory? And here we have companies like Claros, Jur, Aragon, Delphi, Rhubarb, more, some have come, some have gone. Um, we've seen different um, ones that don't exist anymore. Um, and, and what it is, is we have essentially blockchain and crowdsourced dispute resolution. What do we mean by that? We mean that all of these token holders, individuals who go and purchase these tokens, then become voters. And so then a case could be presented to the jurors within Claros, for example, and those jurors will then put their tokens toward whichever party they believe will win. And I say will win, not who's right. And the reason I say that is because the way it works is that you as a token holder, you wanna bet on the winning team. Because if you bet on the party that eventually wins, then the tokens held by those that voted for the losing party will now go to all of those that voted for the winning party. So it's in your interest to vote for the party you think will win based on the evidence presented. Now, if you're applying straight game theory, it does in fact make sense that the one who is right, who has the best evidence, will actually be the one that most of the jurors will pick because they would surmise that the person with the best evidence will win, that they're both right and they'll win. However, there could be gamification. There could be juror tampering. There could be other issues that occur within this tokenized system. So we can sort of question whether or not we believe that this is fair, or we can even ask ourselves, what is justice? Maybe the justice that is requested in this case is simply quick, fast, and we want to use a system like this. Because if we are putting our agreements on the blockchain and we're betting on decentralized enforcement, then we may in fact want decentralized justice. In fact, I met with the CTO of Claros long ago, I think it was 2018, um, in Montreal at a coffee shop. And I really wanted to see exactly how it works and I really wanted to understand. And he explained, and I really, I, it made sense. You know, he said most of the people who are using Claros believe in the math. They're crypto economists, right? And so this idea of decentralized justice makes sense for someone who is trusting the math. If you talk to many individuals who hold Bitcoin and who bet heavily on Bitcoin, it's because they actually trust the math and this decentralized ledger system more than they trust the World Bank, for example. You could even see automated or bot resolutions coming on scene. I know my current research is actually more focused on this use of AI and artificial intelligence and what's going to happen with using data analytics and AI for resolutions. We could see a, a situation where that is exactly what individuals want when it comes to justice. But I would ask us to pause and to always think about dispute system design and the principles of dispute system design and ask ourselves, number one, who are the leaders in this field? It's, unreally, it's really unclear right now. Um, it is sort of you know, the wild west when it comes to um, dispute resolution on the blockchain. We don't really have governance. We don't really have, I mean, we know more Nikkei and we know all of us who are part of iCoder um, and I actually just upped my dues again, so I'm happy to be a part of iCoder. Um, and, uh, you know, 
do we have clear leaders in this world and do we have ethical standards that are in place? Design process. You know, it's important to involve the stakeholders. And oftentimes we do not see all of the stakeholders involved in deciding a certain process. Process pluralism, considering functional analysis. You know, did we create a system that makes sense? Now, one could argue that decentralized justice makes sense in a decentralized system. Because when you talk about functional analysis, you're talking about fitting the technology to the fuss, not just fitting the forum to the fuss as we talk about in ADR, but fitting the technology of the fuss as we talk about in ODR. But also having an ongoing commitment, thinking about incentives, learning from mistakes and improving the system based on research. I would argue that in dispute system design for blockchain, you have to watch out for conflicts of interest, bias and power relations. I do think it's smart to use the traits of blockchain to enhance blockchain dispute resolution, things like integrity of data and enforcement of resolutions. And using that dispute data for constant improvement with the system. Claros, for example, does continually conduct research seeking to improve the system which I think is very helpful. User-centric and practical design is absolutely clear. Finally, I invite us all to think about this regulation of smart contracts in the blockchain and what that looks like. You know, I do think there's a clear need for ODR to resolve smart contract disputes. It just doesn't make sense to go to a physical court of law for a smart contract dispute. But we also have to realize that it's impractical to code for all possible breaches of contract off bugs in the system for fraud, for unconscionability, for unpredictable behavior, for bad coding, for miss mistakes in coding, at the same time preserving the integrity, the anonymity and efficiency of smart contracts. Again, insisting on ethical design, ethical execution, and I will put a plug in for iCoder and their principles and standards, which really set a good starting place for us all when we think about ethical ODR. And that should apply on the blockchain, just as it does in other types of disputes. So with that, I will thank you very much for taking time and thank you for spending my birthday with me. Um, I also invite you to take a look at my papers. I did write a paper on this with Colin Rule, and I have some other articles specifically having to do with making um, smart contracts smarter um, with ODR, and they're all for free on my SSRN page, which is provided there below. So with that, I am going to stop the share, and I am going to end the slideshow here. And so we should be back to full view. And I gave plenty of time because I'm looking forward to discussion, especially now that I know we've got ringers in the audience who know a lot about this, <clears throat> Dr. Harani. So um, without further ado, Anne Merez and Moranike on the ethics. So I hope that we can have a robust discussion. I think that this will be um, much, very interesting and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very, very much for sticking. In fact, you didn't stick to time. You bit the record in terms of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for that. It was such an insightful conversation. I mean, I loved every bit of it. I didn't want you to stop. I must confess, you know, many oh. things. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, many things stood up for me, um, you know, using blockchain technology for more credible elections. You know, I, I mean, many, many things I could go on about it. But I, I, am, I, I like the idea of you um, asking for comments or you know for a robust robust conversation from um, a distinguished audience so please if anyone wants to chip in anything add to it ask a question the floor is now open you may unmute your microphone and we'll be very happy to hear from you Merez has her hand up and so does Andre I see so far Oh, yes, perfect. So we'll take it in, in, in that order. So Mirez, over to you, please. You may unmute your, your microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, um, Amy, I had, I had a concern with respect to dispute resolution and how is, it's going to work out. So you have pointed out all the issues that we may face and how we should solve them. So I think we are still far away from getting to um, an answer, at least uh, to... Um, 
make sure that parties do not fall in the trap of being faced with a deadlock situation. Um, I have no answer. I was just going to make the, this comment. I agree with you, though, that ODR is probably the best um, road to travel for uh, solving um, chain contracts. And now I have a question, and please forgive my ignorance, Amy and, uh, and Sarah, who have worked a lot on these issues. Now, uh, let's assume that, you know, that lawyers love proof and uh, we need the proof in order to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, the decision or the, 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 the award is enforced. Now, um, can parties, for instance, who choose to use a chain contract, print that contract, adapt it to their needs and sign it and keep it as a proof? Or is it supposed to be used as is uh, and stay online without any, and, and, any copy signed by the parties? That's a fantastic question. And this is why I wanted to go to questions because it's like different slides and different things that I didn't fully explain because I thought, oh, we can go into this some more. And what you're asking about, Merez, is one of the big problems that occurs when you're talking about, for example, under common law and here, at least in the US, we deal with the statute of frauds. And like you said, proof and what kind of proof would you have? Um, and this is where you do run into problems because if, if a crypto economist, for example, will say, no, that that's not really possible. Why? Because it's in this distributed ledger that is on the blockchain. And it's not the kind of thing where you can like print it out um, because it is distributed on these ledgers throughout many, many, many computers that are the nodes in the blockchain in the smart contract. And so it's on, all, it's a distributed ledger that is purely in code form on many different contracts. So it wouldn't be the type of thing that you would be able to, for example, print out and then edit on paper, right? You would have to do it. And if it's a public chain, and if it's append only, you would actually have to append that database in this distributed ledger. So it becomes very problematic for that type of proof. And if you're looking for that type of proof, now one could argue that application of, for example, um, the international treaty on enforcement of e-contracts, you know, with sort of enforcing digital signatures, that the cryptographic key becomes your digital signature, and then that would suffice to be a digital signature that would be sufficient for, for example, the statute of frauds or showing that you agreed or showing your assent to that smart contract. So there are different ways to look at this as well under particular laws, because, for example, I know here in the United States, there are various states that wanted to become hubs for smart contracts. And so they have passed laws in their state to enforce smart contracts in the blockchain pursuant to a cryptographic key. I don't know if that answers your question, but I'll give you some examples. It does, and actually, and if um, I mean, if, if the case goes to court, uh, how was, would these courts um, have access to the document as it stood at the time of the agreement? So this would be really difficult, if not impossible. And so that's why I argue that you know going to an actual court is not you know really feasible. Um, I guess what you could do, however. So one thing that has happened, you might have read in the news or some of you might have seen different media about people who like lost billions of dollars in crypto because they lost their cryptographic key. Um, I don't know, if it, but there's lots of sort of media and stories about it. And for example, with Bitcoin, where they just lost their cryptographic key and couldn't find it. And without that, they can't enforce anything. And so um, oftentimes it would come down to making sure that you found your cryptographic key. And then I imagine since the ledger, it is a transparent ledger and it's supposed to be on all of these you know, computers, AKA nodes. Um, so arguably you could say that it would be possible to produce your cryptographic key along with perhaps one um, copy of the ledger on some sort of way that you would transport that um, electronically to a court, I suppose, um, in order to prove up your, you know, that you deserve the rights to, for example, cryptocurrency. 
on the benefit balance, I would be very much afraid to use it <laughs> until I see some case <laughs> law and some possibility to get I know. to prove my case. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I talked to you um, because I work with the data and people in computer sciences here, and I'm very heavily involved in sort of this um, law and technology. And so when I say that to them, you know, like, oh, I'm very risk averse, they all own Bitcoin and they're fine with it. So it just depends on what you trust. And if you trust the math and you trust computers more than you trust people, for example, you know, maybe it makes sense for you. So it is true. I'm the same way. I do not own any cryptocurrency myself. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emmy. Thank you. Thank you, Mirez. Can we then have Andre, please? Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for your contribution. I'm one of those elderly people that don't understand technology to whom you were referring. So if it's an ignorant question, forgive me, but the system that you're explaining where people vote uh, for the winner or the loser and the losers forfeit tokens and the other ones gain tokens troubles me because it means that the decision maker has a vested interest in the decision to be made. That's completely foreign to every system in Africa. It's foreign to the states, and I think probably to most of the countries of Europe. So just on a kind of an access to justice, excuse the legal speak, but on an access to justice level, that system bothers me. Could you, could you help me out of my misery or tell me where, I'm, where my reason is wrong? So first of all, you're not an elderly person who doesn't get it because you get it. And that's exactly right. I mean, that's why I actually was just speaking with a group of students and um, we were talking about this idea of this tokenized voting. And I was surprised that people didn't, that they didn't gasp when I explained it because these are a bunch of lawyers to be, you know, these are law students. And I kind of hoped that they would gasp and say, well, wait a minute, what about access to justice? What about the fact that um, decision makers here now have an interest in this outcome. The reason I was sort of very clear in my presentation to say that the jurors have an interest to vote on who they think will win, not who's right. And that is problematic from a tokenized um, and from a sort of access to justice and fairness and procedural justice standpoint. Now, so for me, I'm with you. I actually find this to be problematic. But let me play devil's advocate for a minute with myself, which I, I like to do is argue the other side. So let's look at it this way. What if, however, you do, and I've looked into kind of all the different definitions of justice um, for a different article, kind of, again, in legal speak and being the very sort of going down one of these roads and writing an article, I was researching all the different definitions of justice and what justice is. And justice can mean different things to different people. So what you and I may think about as justice and fairness could be very different from, for example, a crypto economist. What a crypto economist who believes in the math, they believe that this decentralized mathematical code is law system is more fair than, for example, putting all of your reliance on an individual human judge. You may not trust a human judge. Right, you may in fact trust the math, you may trust the network, you may trust this sort of blockchain ledger and the math and the algorithms that tie this, the nodes together more than you trust an individual. And so then for you, believing in this kind of tokenized system using game theory seems more fair because you feel that the procedures, the procedural justice is fair for you. Now, I agree with you, this does not comport with the notions that we have sort of in general common law or civil law for that matter in most countries. But, you know, it's not the only, crowdsourced justice has been around in other sorts of areas. Um, for example, eBay India used it with respect to taking down comments um, regarding, you know, different um, sellers and things like that. Now, that did not have to do with the payment of money. And when you are talking about the payment of money and using this tokenized system, I agree with you. I think it's problematic. Um, but for example, if you asked Federico asked who runs Claros, he would say, well, procedural justice means different people to different, you know, to different people. And so you could look at it that way to find that it is quote unquote justice for you. But I think it really raises this question of what is justice? You know, and I think when we talk about dispute system design. And the reason I brought that up 
is one of the main questions in dispute system design. What are the goals? What are your goals? What are the goals of the stakeholders? And to be more specific, when we talk about the stakeholders in a situation like the smart contracts, you're talking about the parties to the agreement. These are the stakeholders as well as the providers of the system, right? And now when you bring in these um, sort of additional questions of decentralized justice, now you have sort of a larger question of what kind of goals you are trying to seek. But I think it's important to really stop and ask yourself those questions that you asked, Andrea. I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, it's a question. I'd be interested not to call on the audience, but Sarah, do you have thoughts on this? Because I know you've written so extensively on it that I really feel this is be good for you to chime in. Thank you very much, Amy. First of all, it's really nice to see you and everyone and Miraz, you know. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Happy birthday. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your very kind references. Uh, yeah, that's uh, very kind of you. Um, I guess uh, my question is, I, I was trying to type it here. <laughs> um, do you think that consumer trust um, would increase in blockchain-based dispute resolution um, if it's somehow regulated by the state, whether directly or indirectly? Great question. And in fact, um, I was involved in the UNSEE trial, just had um, a working group too. And then we were talking about regulation just of ODR in general. And I think the thing you run into is how do you regulate by law, by legislation, um, a very fast moving target. Um, technology is moving faster than we can um, deal with. I mean, this is why iCoder and other organizations become very important because you need a certain dose of self-regulation um, because in fact, you are going to run into issues when you try to use legislation um, because it usually does not move fast enough, right? It's very reactionary, politics come into play. And so it's very hard to build consumer trust via legislation when that legislation may not be able to keep up with the technology. Thank you very much. Um, I guess in the UK, they're trying to, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I think it's a um, work in progress. Um, because they're trying to come up with um, all of these ideas on how to regulate, um, you know, consumers uh, trust and how to improve it and how to regulate uh, these types of transactions. Because you know, as you're saying, and as your work, you know, <laughs> you're famous for that type of work. Um, it's very hard for the consumer, like I guess, mindset to change, like what is being discussed today. Um, so I do agree with you because I think that in a way, like what Claris is doing, um, they're trying to promote another form of community um, justice, um, I guess. Um, and I guess, yeah, it depends on the consumer mindset. So for example, in the UK, they perhaps have, you know, a more, um, you know, especially because the EU has influenced the law so much, um, perhaps they tilt towards wanting to be regulated somehow by somebody, <laughs> by a type of body in order to be able to trust this. Um, and of course you have like people in the community who do trust, um, you know, um, systems like Claros. So yeah, I guess, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, do you think that eventually um, it could be considered as something that um, the state might want to legislate? Yeah, no, I mean, that's why we run into this. Um, in fact, I, I like to keep charts on things. So at one point I was sort of charting different jurisdictions that have in fact passed legislation regarding smart contracts. Now, does it build trust for consumers? Well, I think you have to go to the question of whether or not, number one, do consumers even know that the regulation exists? Um, Nine times out of 10, um, my own, I actually did empirical research on this years back about what do consumers actually know? They don't know. <laughs> so, you know, if there is a law passed, will they read it? No. Will they understand it? No. So is it going to build trust? Probably not. Um, and so, you know, it's, I think, important to build trust through other mechanisms. One way that I have seen some trust is where you see it legitimized. So for example, I know when Rocket Lawyer decided to start incorporating and allowing for the use of cryptocurrencies for building smart contracts, that sort of legitimized smart contracts for consumers in a way 
that made it real to them because they thought, okay, wait, if Rocket Lawyer is willing to work with them, maybe I'm okay with this. Um, and we've seen this, you know, in fact, Facebook has even you talked about creating their own token. And there's been a lot of different sort of where we see it legitimized. And I think when you see it mainstreamed and legitimized within particular corporations, that's when consumers start to trust it. Um, and so I think it is this, you know, trying to create a way for companies to see a reason to do things ethically and do it in the right way. And then it becomes legitimized within those companies and within these sort of institutions. I think that's how you actually help build trust. Um, so I do think, and I also going back to sort of the crypto economists, um, they already are building their own community and they already are trusting the blockchain more than they trust people. So I think that's another, you know, even if we look at, for example, with the invasion of Ukraine, um, lots of people in Russia put, they went ahead and dumped, they were buying up cryptocurrency because they were trusting the math and trusting blockchain more than they were trusting government. And so I think that's another way that we're seeing this movement toward decentralized um, avenues. Does that make sense? But, but Amy, uh, when you speak about confidence, I guess that like eBay, if we don't publish the decisions or the um, enforcement of any any decision potentially like on eBay, uh, how would people um, uh, acquire this trust in a system or in a company using blockchain or other systems? Yeah, well, arguably, Claros is transparent, right? So um, arguably, if you understand how to sort of do a deep dive into the system, um, the, the ledger is, it would be transparent who won and who lost and what was presented. Um, because it's in the blockchain, right? In a um, transparent blockchain. So if you asked um, Federico with um, Claros, he would say, well, it is transparent. It's more transparent on the blockchain and with Claros than it is, for example, eBay, right? And so you could say that it is transparent. I mean, at least that's one benefit, I will say, um, when you're talking about blockchain, if that helps. And Warnike, I'm so sorry, you had your hand up. It's fine, it's fine. In fact, everything I wanted to say is kind of like um, woven around the things you have said. And I was actually going to talk to the issue of dispute um, system designs and to say that the people who actually design those kind of justice, because justice to them can only be in respect to their environment. And we all know that in DSD that justice for you is what you design it to be because you want it to meet the needs of those particular people that you want to resolve disputes that arise within their system. So for them, that is justice. And a very good example is eBay because for so many of those disputes that were said, so we all see the numbers and we're out. The reason why they were is because people thought it was better to just take this and move on quickly because what they were interested in was not the legality, the right or wrong, but the fact that they could get it fast, efficient, and allow the system move on. So for, for example, for them, that is justice. So it's really not your perception of justice wherever you are, but it's at that point and in that circle, what is justice and what they planned or designed it to be. And that's what it is in the blockchain. So yes, we see all of the problems and I agree with you and Andre and all of that. But then for them, it cannot be anywhere else. Legislation is territorial. What we're talking about is nowhere territorial. So it's not possible to use legislation to deal with issues that are not territorial. So those were just my comments, just to support, address what you've all been saying really. No, okay. that's fantastic. And I just want to add on to that a little bit further, because, yeah, if we think about even if you were a pure doing sort of cost benefit analysis, right, and you really wanted to sort of think of it from a cost benefit analysis, based on what you're saying as well, Mornike, and I agree, I mean, you can have individuals, for example, where they decide they're using this sort of decentralized system because efficiency is something that they value more than anything else because that's why they're using a smart contract, right? Because smart contract by its very nature is very efficient. And so if you really, that's what you believe in and that's what you want, then that quick decision with automatic enforcement on the blockchain, 
is justice for you because that's what you value. So it really comes back down to value. And let me give it a kind of the contrary. If on the other hand, if what you are trying to do is sue, for example, about sexual harassment in the workplace, you're not gonna use blockchain because what you value is you want your day in court. You want to get it out there. You want to vent. There are different values that you have with respect to what you want, your goals, going back to dispute system design, are very different. And so you're never going to use a blockchain um, dispute resolution system. Um, and I think what we also see really going to system design as well is that since you know, we've seen some of these like Claro Singer kind of created um, now five years ago, they've really not taken off in other areas. I mean, it's really pretty particular to areas where you have individuals who are fully ensconced in blockchain. They believe in blockchain. They're part of the decentralized justice community. Um, great example is, for example, well, when he was showing me Kleros in action, the dispute that he showed me was a dispute regarding whether or not a particular cryptocurrency should be listed on one of the main crypto exchanges. And there was a dispute about whether or not that cryptocurrency was valid and should be listed on the exchange. And so you had basically the proponent of a cryptocurrency and another cryptocurrency company who was fighting that cryptocurrency, right? And so you had all people who are incredibly ensconced in the blockchain community, who believe in decentralized community, who believe in decentralized justice. And to Mareza's point as well, they actually felt it was very transparent because all of these other users are all on the chain and it's transparent. And so you get to know who wins, who, you, who loses and why. Um, and so for that reason, um, it is justice for them. And really, if you look at it, you would see that if it's transparent, it's one of the ICODA standards. <laughs> so it actually, it's accountable, it's transparent and it suits the particularly. So it sure does meet the standards within their framework. Yep. If we want to fit the um, fit the technology to the fuss, as we say, yes, Mraz. But perhaps not all the needs actually, even if it's accountable and so on. So this is why um, I, I think that the um, the chain contract is not necessarily adapted to all kinds of agreements or situations. But anyway, coming back to to your comment, um, Morenike, with respect to justice, and as I wrote in the chat, actually, what I consider actually in eBay. Um, the person only needed to get its, its rights. So I, I need to have either um, uh, uh, um, the product replaced because it's not functional or get my money back. So this is what justice is to me, obtaining what I'm entitled to. They would not necessarily question any legal aspect, but they want to get what they are, what they are entitled to. I, I guess that we can sum it up to, um, to, we can sum at least up justice to this, basic need of getting my right in my view okay but you know I, sometimes they could get less than what they would ordinarily get right. if they had to go further and they would settle for that because yeah. it was faster and more efficient to just yeah. be able to stay within the community and get along we, we agree and ebay is really the the, the perfect example yeah I would raise one concern that I do have, especially from a consumer protection standpoint. Um, and it's this, I think the one concern coming online now is the fact that many consumers don't understand what they're getting themselves into. So they may in fact purchase cryptocurrency without having any idea what they're doing um, because it's a fad, because you know they hear, oh, I can make a quick buck, but they don't really understand what they're entering into. And so I do think there are some absolute concerns about smart contracts from that standpoint, because often um, it's not transparent to you when you're first, even if it's transparent once you're in it on the ledger, I'm talking about just your decision to actually enter into it, to purchase cryptocurrency, to enter into a smart contract, to use even Rocket Lawyer or something along those lines. Do you really understand what you're getting into? And oftentimes you don't because, um, to Mraz's question earlier about this idea, you know, can you print it out and read it over? No, because you're not going to understand it, right? I mean, even when I showed you sort of, and that was taken directly from a smart contract idea for voting and secure voting. Um, those were screenshots that I had taken from an actual example. Um, 
I couldn't understand it. I don't know, maybe you could, but I couldn't. I don't read computer code. So um, would a consumer be able to read computer code and understand what they're getting into? Um, that I think is a problem. Um, and you know, to Sarah's point as well, I think we do have certain laws in most countries that could apply. For example, in the US, we already have deceptive trade practices laws and laws under the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And so you might be able to argue that some of these companies putting forth these different sort of promising, these efficient ways to purchase things using cryptocurrency or whatever it might be. Well, if it's deceptive in the way that it's marketed or they provide information that is not correct, you would be able to sue under deceptive trade practices law. Um, and similarly in the EU, you have different consumer protections that actually could already apply. Um, especially if you have fraud or something along those lines. So I think, you know, there's a lot of law that already does exist that could be applicable in these different situations. But I just think it does raise this, you know, not everyone getting into um, smart contracts understands smart contracts. And that I think is problematic. The other piece that is really interesting, I was talking to healthcare um, companies, and this was a while back, and they were talking about the use of blockchain to secure the information, because as we know, hospitals have information that is very sensitive. And so they are subject to very stringent standards in terms of that information and data privacy. Now, arguably, and of course, some of these um, smart contract companies and some of those blockchains will say, okay, we can really keep your information secure. It's 100%. It's much more ironclad than putting something, um, any other kind of security that you might have. But actually, it is hackable. Uh, everything is hackable. And so the minute you think that anything, any system is 100% secure, you're kidding yourself. And so, you know, that I think is another sort of trap that a company can fall into if they're relying on smart contracts, if they're relying on the blockchain to be this sort of fix-all, um, it's not perfect. And anything is hackable um, and nothing is fully secure. Um, that I, I believe strongly in. <laughs> the concern you raised also, Amy, is to get courts to understand if ever a case ends up at, at a court. Mm -hmm. issue, I think. Can you imagine how expensive that would be? I think about as, you know, back in the day I was a litigator um, and uh, I think about all of the cost of hiring experts to prove up a case like this, very expensive litigation. So that's why another reason why I think it has to be online arbitration perhaps, online dispute resolution of some form that I think is absolutely going to be better than trying to go to a court of law. But, but the problem of proof remains, whatever, whatever, oh, yeah. whatever forum you choose uh, for the dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But proof in the OJ house, in the OJ house space will be different from proof as you would expect in the court. So I'm sure they'll be able to work around that. Yes, but it's going to take time, uh, Moronike, because you need to get people to, to learn about the system, to trust it as, um, um, as raised earlier. And we, we know that it's, it's been over 20 years that we've been working with ODR and people still don't trust it. So how about uh, chain contracts <laughs> and about all these, uh, all these uh, technical material that may be helpful at the end of the day, but when? Not necessarily now. I mean, I would not personally trust or use it now. I think I need to see more of it and, and more case law and, and, and trust it. So you're speaking to a lawyer who's saying that, what about the lay person? So that's going to be uh, that's going to be difficult. But it's an interesting it's an interesting field. And thank you very much. But it has to start somewhere. And what what you probably have is like you have um, a group of people like um, turning down the rules and regulations to be able to accommodate themselves within that space since they've agreed and they have so much faith in it. That's what you probably do. It'll, come, it will be more private justice, and they've been able to agree. ADR, it's really party autonomy. So they move on there and they agree how they want to move and agree to be bound by it. 
But it will take time. I agree with you completely, Miris. That, that being said, Morenike, I mean, see now during the two years of pandemic, uh, it, it, it has expanded using technology just because of the hearings and the meetings that nobody thought would ever be possible beforehand. When I built Netcase 20 years ago, when I spoke about integrating a system for hearing and getting the, the, the parties to stay on that space and not move out of the space of their case to uh, proceed to the hearing, nobody believed me and said, no, this is not doable. And it took us the pandemic to have everyone going online and, and, and using um, virtual hearings. So mm -hmm. it really depends. And actually it's, everything is um, a question of opportunity or momentum of something happening. So who knows, to be followed. Yeah. There was no yeah. worse in Africa, getting people to get online, <laughs> I can assure you, it was, it was worse. And the people looked at me like I was a clown out of coming from the moon when I talked about ODL over a decade ago. And they just, what's wrong with this woman? She must be coming from space or something. When I did that here in Nigeria and all over, and I'm sure Andre, even though Andre is not, um, He's not a big fan of technology, but uh, even Andre, sometimes when I talk to him and he's like, Renike, are you sure this is going to work? So I know what you mean. <laughs> well, and the thing is, you're right, the pandemic has really just shifted everybody's acceptance of technology, right? And things that never would have been, and now it's like everybody, you know? Um, and so I do, but it also shines a light on the digital divide. Um, and I think it's really important for us to always make things mobile friendly when we're talking about um, access to justice and creating online systems, because most individuals, that's how they access the internet. And so if we want to have um, ODR that's accessible to everybody, I think making it mobile friendly is tremendously important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry to chip in uh, with one last thing. I totally agree with you, Amy, I think, and and uh, what Mirez and Mornike have um, also said, I think that we're seeing um, uh, you know, a, a varying, um, uh, a variation of justice, and it's going through a lot of changes. And what consumers perceive as being just and fair and equitable, I think, is quite, yeah, is uh, quite a dynamic <laughs> element at the moment. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you, everyone. I mean, it's um, one minute to six. And we have a strict 6 p.m. deadline. So we will have to end it here. Um, thank you very much, Professor Smith, for spending your birthday with us and for delivering that session. It was fantastic. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Thank you to those who contributed. I mean, you know, it was so interactive. It felt like we're all in the same room somewhere. So I know. even though, you know, we're all for innovation and technology, there will be room to gather physically at some point. So thank you everyone um, for today. Thank you to the hosts as well. Thank you very much, ODR Africa. And if I have their permission, we can close the meeting. Thank you. I just want to say a thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Amy. Thank Happy you, birthday, Gay. Thank you. Thank you. We had the birthday song at the beginning. <laughs> and enjoy the rest of your day. Your day is just starting anyway. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We'll, have you soon. we'll have you again soon. <gasps> Sounds great. Be well, everyone. Thank well, you. I, so much, and I, mean, I, I should say thank you for being the very good. Thank chaperone. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very thank much you. for having thank me. You, Mirez, thank you, Mirez, our advisory board members, Mirez, Juan. Thank you, Andre, Thomas, Grace, Erima, Ayosia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>